1991, Capcom were on a roll, with arcades starting to fill up again thanks to the versus fighting craze that kicked off a few months before the release of this game. Midnight Wanderers was a game that featured in an arcade cabinet known as Three Wonders. Three games in one cabinet, and those games were Midnight Wanderers, Chariot and Don't Pull. Midnight Wanderers and Chariot were linked in gameplay, story and characters, but Don't Pull was an odd puzzle game, which, to this day, I have still never played. This video, however, is on Midnight Wanderers, as this was a game I absolutely adored back in the day. The game is a platform game that sees the player control a hobbit named Lou and his travelling companion Siva to run, climb and shoot at enemies to fight a villain who is turning their people into wooden statues. The plot of the game was very basic. Lou's friend Siva has been turned into a statue by Gaia, the boss of the game, and it is up to the player to see that she is returned to her human form. Lou and Siva, the wanderers of the title, are the kingdom's only hope. They must enter Gaia's castle, defeat the demon, and use the magical card of the dawn to reawaken the chariot. After having recovered the artifact, Lou and Siva must use it to fly into the sky and save the princess of Ashtar, who was kidnapped by Gaia's superior, Lar. So when you beat the game, it does end, but the story continues on into Chariot, which was a bit confusing, as one game didn't just merge into the other, you had to pay to play each game. But if you are like me and not interested in how the story ends, then it's not a problem. I also did not play Chariot at all in the arcades at that time, as I felt it didn't look all that good. But Midnight Wanderers on the other hand, one look at these visuals and you have to admit, it's a very, very pretty looking game indeed. Oddly though, I never seen this cabinet in arcades. They were most common in bowling alleys and cinemas and it was in the cinema that I played Midnight Wanderers. And so whenever I see this game, I always get reminded of that fresh popcorn smell you only ever get in cinemas. What a great smell that was. It's making me hungry for popcorn right now. Getting back to the game, and as I mentioned, these visuals are very impressive for the time and the CPS hardware is becoming renowned for producing some great looking visuals. The sprite work is fantastic on the main characters, Lou and Siva, although pretty small, a bit like Knight Arthur from Ghouls and Ghosts, but superbly detailed. When the characters run, you can see the hair and hat flopping about, and the run itself is glorious looking. And when you shoot, you can see the recoil taking its effect on the player. Enemy trolls are just as nice, and it's not very often you hear a troll being described as nice looking, but in this game they are, and they manage to capture the troll tropes perfectly. The long pointy nose and the tall pointy ears. Other enemies look great too, with nice detail on this tree boss, albeit with no real animation, and the first level boss which looks huge compared to the heroes has some really great animation on its kind of Simeon-esque crawl, and it's got a face like the Predator. The backgrounds on all the levels are simply exquisite and really beautifully drawn. The first level, set in the woods, looks gorgeous, and then on the second level in the water scenes, you get this nice blued out water transparency effect as you walk along the underwater ruins. The third level changes gears a little. 
The backgrounds resemble this kind of ravaged kingdom, which looks amazing. And the enemies all change up as well. The trolls are mostly gone. And in their place are these kind of evil looking marionettes, which again have an impressive amount of detail on them for a small sprite. Overall, the visuals in this game are simply outstanding. And when you seen it in the arcades at the time, it really did stand out. Of course, it was obvious that it was a Capcom game, as it had that visual style of theirs. The other thing that really stood out in this game was the sound. The sound effects in particular. When entering the ticket office in the UCI cinema in Clyde Bank, you could hear this game long before you seen it. The sound of the card collecting and the extra life jingles are loud, and the sound of the flying treasure box is also very loud. But these are sounds I love. And when I hear them today, they really do take me back to those carefree younger days I cherished. It's definitely a sound from my childhood. The music is of top quality as well. Each level has a tune that accompanies the action and is perfectly suited. None of them are toe tappers though, and you will probably forget most of them once you walk away from the game, but each tune is great. The melodies, the beats, the sounds. This game has it all, and that includes the playability. This game is fantastic. It's a very lot like Ghouls and Ghosts, except not as hard and a simultaneous two player. When your character gets hit, they lose their armour and run around in their underwear, just like Ghouls and Ghosts. But this game is a little more forgiving than Ghouls and Ghosts, and is every bit as enjoyable, especially on the two player. Each level is timed. So you can't just dawdle your way through the game either. You need to keep the pace up. Because it's surprising how quickly the time can just run away from you. It's by no means an easy game though. The going can get very tough. But the gameplay is incredibly addictive. It's like the complete package this game. Whenever I would go to the cinema, I would always look to have a go or two on this after the movie. The public transportation at the time was very unreliable and a bus back home would only appear every two hours or so, so there would always be plenty of time. Me and a mate would spend the last of our change on this game and was actually one of the first arcade games I was able to beat on a single credit. A feat I was very proud of indeed, but not something I have been able to recreate all that often since. On a visit back to the cinema, and after watching Batman Returns, me and my mate played this game and beat it, and to our surprise, we had a little crowd behind us who seemed to be just as pleased at our efforts as we were, but we hadn't noticed them at all when playing the game, which just shows you how immersive the game can be. Midnight Wanderers can take about 30 minutes or less to beat, and so, 
If you have time waiting for a movie to start, or waiting for a bus, it was a perfect way to kill those 20 or 30 minutes. I played the game quite a number of times over the years, and was disappointed that it had not been ported over to the Super NES or anything, as I felt like it could probably have been a pretty decent port for that machine. But I guess Capcom had other ideas. The cabinet itself was not massively successful for Capcom, but then they were riding on the success of another game of theirs. But that is a video for another time. The game did appear on a PlayStation a few years later, but was not considered to be a great port at all, and I never picked it up. So nowadays I play it on MAME and I encourage you all to have a go for yourself, if you have the ability to do so. And that was my look back at Midnight Wanderers. If you like this video, then please do give me a sub and a thumbs up, or maybe even a comment or two below about your memories of Midnight Wanderers. And a massive thank you to all of those who have subscribed and commented on my channel. Your feedback and support goes a long way in helping the channel grow and I do appreciate all of you, so a heartfelt thank you from me. And that's all from me folks, thanks for watching.